I know the Lord said, have no fear. <laughs> Craig, you are forgiven and you are loved. <sighs> From the yarn addicts of Wellspring <laughs> Bible <laughs> Fellowship. <laughs> the taste of humble pie. <laughs> I appreciate my forgiveness. I will endeavor to repent. What, it's a work in progress. Aren't we all? <sighs> yes, it'll be right there staring at me. Thank you, Stan. I, I see that. I suppose I had that coming. <laughs> Not that I hadn't heard it a lot in the last week already or two, so. <clears throat> Maybe this is a good lead-in to uh, 1 John chapter 3, 10 and 11. If you're joining us online, welcome to Wellspring Bible Fellowship. We're going to be in 1 John chapter 3, uh, and we're going to be in verses... Uh, well, 11 through 24, but I'm going to pick up verse 10 real quick just for context. And in light of, of that, this, this really seems to fit in very well. 1 John 3, 10 through 11, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. <laughs> Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I love those who work with yarn. I love you from the bottom of my heart. And you love yarn, and it's obvious because you have great abundance of love. <laughs> okay. Righteousness and love. You know, John makes this point to us, and he says that anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother, for this is the message which you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I mean, my goodness, isn't this the core essence of the gospel? Love. And to love one another. I mean, we're going to talk about, you know, the, the love that the Lord, that Jesus had for us, and that gets carried on, passed on through us. If we are loving him, then we ought to love others and love one another. And that should be obvious. I mean, it's like a coin. Any, most of us here probably have some knowledge of coins. Anybody ever seen a one-sided coin? It just doesn't exist. I mean, you may have different sides of it, different faces on it, or maybe one face and no face, but every coin has two sides. Well, this is the coin of righteousness, if you will. Righteousness and love. You simply cannot have one without the other and not in the way that God wants us to do, not truly to be loving to one another, not to truly be righteous. Now, and there's a big churchy word, righteous, right? So what does it mean to be righteous? I've heard it said, you know, well, it's right living. Okay, but yeah, but there's lots of people that right, are right living. What well, means to be a good person? Okay, well, there's lots of people who are good people. So what's this difference? What makes righteousness? The idea behind righteousness, this word that we find throughout our scripture, we find it all over the Bible. God talks about his righteousness, our righteousness, what is righteousness? What is right living in the aspect that it is morally, ethically correct living, but not by my standard, not by the world's standards, not by any guru who wrote a book's standard other than God. It is right living, morally, ethically living by God's standard. But therein lies the other key element of it, because it's not just, it, it's not just something that is, it's something we do. Righteousness is not, is not a state of being, it's a state of working and acting and living out righteousness. And the way that we live that out is in love toward one another. So we're going to talk more about this, but the idea I want you to start developing in your mind is this idea of brotherly love. As we come into, you know, the, the idea that we ought to be loving not only one another here within the church, but also outside the church. 
But most importantly, I suppose, as we look around here, if we're harboring resentment toward one another in the church, boy, is that righteous. No. No, it's not right standards, not by God's standards for sure. And John tells us, he says, as we live this out in conduct, in deed, right living toward God, morally, ethically correct, according to God, are we loving people the way that God wants us to love people? And it's easy to love people the way that I want to love people, or maybe the way that you want to love people, but is that as thorough and as complete as the model that God gave us? And if it's not, then we've got work to do. We've got room to improve. John says, far from a new saying, that this is something that has been said from the beginning. It's been something that's been said repeatedly to love one another. Looking at John 13, 34, and 35. Oh, jump verses. They're on there again. You might see some consistency with that. If they're up there, I'm probably going to go to it at some point. John 13, 34 through 35, the Lord said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Now, the Lord had already said previous to this that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and the second was much like it was to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Everybody got that one down cold, right? We're all loving God with everything we have. Heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. Okay, maybe we got work to do there too. Are we loving our neighbor like we love ourselves? That whole, that, that magic, well, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's where this comes from. Are we doing that to our neighbors? Well, then the Lord says, he takes it another step. He says, that's all well and good. Once you've got that covered, great. Now, if you're going to be a follower of mine, I want you to love others the way that I loved you. Oh, now, wait a minute, because I know, I know how God loved me. I know how the Lord loved me. You know, here's the other thing. He says, this is a recommendation that I suggest to you. <laughs> On the days when things are going pretty well and the people around you seem pretty lovable, love one another. No. No, Jesus said, I command you to do this. Here's an interesting note I want you to take historically about God. If God commands you to do something, I have a suggestion. I'm just throwing it out there. You might want to do it. Because I've seen the consequences to those that did not do what God commanded them to do. Read the story of Jonah. Don't wait for God to swallow you with a big fish. Choose to obey God. When God gives us commands, let's choose to obey them. And not only that, he says, by this, people will know that you are my followers. How are people going to know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Well, that's simple, right? Hi, my name's Craig. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Done, right? Perfect. Is that it? It's not it. No, because we got too many fakers, too many posers out there. we got too many people that, that treat, treat uh, following God like, like politics or like positions on just about anything else. And you can say just about anything you want to say. But people will take much more, or put much more credit on what you do, more than what you say. It's fine for me to say I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but if I don't live that out, then it really doesn't mean anything. My concern is that it doesn't mean anything to me. And if I'm not living it out, then I wonder what it means to God. By this, the world will know that you are my followers. John 15, verses 8 through 11 the Lord said, my father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I've spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. The Lord said that this is what glorifies our Father in heaven. This is what makes God in heaven happy, is when we bear much fruit. Now, don't get me wrong, there's lots of fruits in here. We're some of the fruitiest people I've ever seen. Do I need to go get the bag of yarn again? No. I, I, I digress. God is happy when he sees us bear fruit. Good fruit. And by fruit, he means works. This, in the Bible, when we see him referring to fruits, he's talking about the works. He's talking about the deeds. He's talking about what do you do with the hours that you've been given? We've all got only so many days to live this thing we called life. 
And when it's all said and done, you could go back and look at a person's life and read the chapters of their life. And the question is, what'd you do? What'd you do that brought glory to God? What'd you do that showed love toward one another in the days that you had? Jesus says, when we bear good fruit and we have good works, we do two things. We bring glory to his father in heaven. And again, he says, we prove to be his disciples. Now, does that mean that, that people that don't have Jesus in their life, don't have the spirit of God in their heart, can't do good things? Of course not. But we're talking about righteousness. He said, righteousness leads to brotherly love on a biblical standard, on a godly standard, judged by his righteousness, not ours. There's lots of people out there that do lots of good things. But God says, that I want you to not just be good, I want you to be righteous, to have that standard of good judged by my standard, not just the world's. Jesus says, if we abide in the Father's love, if we live in the Father's love, if it's what we live for and live through, because the Father loved him, and he says, and I lived through the Father, and I loved the Father. Jesus says, and I'll love you too. And therefore, he says that we ought to abide in his love, in the Lord's love, to live in it, to live through it, to live because of his love. When we have Jesus in our life and we've accepted that, that, that act of, of forgiveness for our sins, then it changes everything in our heart. The focus no longer becomes the world's focus of how great I art and how much I might get, how much glory I might receive because of how wonderful I am, because I am such a wonderful person, which is what the world wants us to believe, which the world teaches us to believe, what the commercials push on us. And we say, you know what? It's not about me. It, be, it stopped being about me the minute I realized that my life led only to death and separation from God because of my sin. The minute I realized that and accepted the gift of Jesus Christ as the forgiveness for my sins, then I stopped living for myself, God's word says. I started living for him. And when we do that, it changes it. It changes it for, from the focus of love for me to love for him. And if I love him, that affects the way that I live, or it ought to. Most of us here have somebody that we love. Hopefully it's somebody sitting next to you. We all have somebody that we love. And when we do that, we see the way that we respond and we act and we react to them. And we need to be doing some of these same things for the Lord, to honor the Lord, to make sacrifices for the Lord, to give of my time, my essence, my money, my whatever it is, to, to give things up, to make him more important than me, to care for the things that he cares for, to commit to the things that he's committed to, to seek the things that make him happy instead of always focusing on the things that make me happy. And doggone it, that's hard. In a world where, so, where all the, the, the soft, pleasurable things are just right there, where all the fun things are right there, where all the wrong things are right there, it's so hard to look at all that stuff and say, boy, that could be really good for me, and to walk away from it to saying that I want to live my life because of what he has done for me and make it not about me, but about him. That's hard. It's not easy, and it's a day-by-day -day battle. And then he says to love one another. And when we love one another, he says, then his joy in us is complete, that our joy is full when we, when we have that love for one another. Over 30 places in the Bible, very easily you can go, and you can find verses that talk about brotherly love, having love for one another. Why does God's word talk so much about having love for one another? because the world is filled with hate. And the world is filled with loss and it's filled with loneliness. So he comes to us and he says, I don't want you to engage that world of hate and have that become a part of you. I want you to engage the world of love and have that be what defines you. When somebody looks at you, I want them to be able to say, that person right there loves Jesus. And you know how they know? They know because of the way that you love others. That's where it becomes apparent. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the difficult becomes the reality, is when we say, you know what, fine. I don't necessarily find you the most lovable person today, but I'm going to love you anyway. God doesn't necessarily find us the most lovable person each day. Husbands, wives, is not always the most lovable person each day, right? I'm not even gonna look that way. <laughs> because I know that mine is nodding her head up and down. <laughs> we're not. We're not the most lovable people every day. And yet the Lord loves us every day and tells us to love one another every day. We're going to blow it with each other. We're going to make each other mad. We're going to let each other down. Love one another 
every day. Forgive as we have been forgiven. He gives us a really good example here in John 15, verses 12 through 14. The Lord said, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Again, the Lord says, this is, I'm not suggesting this. It's not a golly if you feel like it today. No, he says, I command you to love one another and to love one another the way that I loved you. And that brings out a really big problem for us because Jesus and his great love for his died for you. He died for me. He sacrificed himself so that I could live. And he says, I want you to love one another as I loved you. Any volunteers? Anyone want to, to, to demonstrate that great example that Christ gave for us? Many have. Many have, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, said, yes, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it has cost them their life. And there will be many more. I pray that it's never one of us, but someday it might be. I look at the examples we have locally and around the world where evil has looked Christianity in the face and said, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And the person said, yes, and it cost them their life. That's a tough choice. And then they came to the second person and they said, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? If it was a tough decision for the first one, how'd you like to be the second one? And the answer that we ought to give is yes. I will pay any price for my Lord who gave himself for me. He says, if we do this, we're friends with him. What's the, what's the opposite of a friend? An enemy. We're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. We're talking about God made flesh. And here's your two choices. You can be an enemy of God or you can be a friend of God. Choose wisely. We're talking God here. He says, and you are my friends if you do these things, if, if you do what I command you. Or maybe we turn it around and reverse it. He says, maybe because you are my friend, obey my commands. Think about the, I hear you, okay. Anybody here have a friend? Okay, good. I mean, that's a whole other counseling session. Does this define one of your close friends, one of your inner circle of friends? Uh, this person is a constant liar to you. They don't trust you. They ignore you. They speak out against you. They'll stab you in the back if you get a chance. If you give them good advice, they just ignore you. Is that, does that describe one of your closest friends? No. And it doesn't describe a friend of Jesus Christ either. If we lie and ignore and rebel and refuse to obey him, how can he call us a friend? How can we call ourselves a friend of God if we constantly rebel against him and refuse to follow his advice and refuse to obey his commandments, if we don't love him, how do we expect him to love us? And yet he says, if we will come to him and if we will confess our sins to him, he will forgive our sins. I'm telling you folks, it's a standard of love we don't have. I can't get to that level of love. But then here's the cool thing. When I say, Lord, I accept your offer of salvation, I believe. He says, I'm sending you the helper. I send you the Holy Spirit. And guess what? The Spirit of God comes into us. And who can reach that level of love? The Spirit of God. So now I have a helper to help me get to that level, to attain a level of love that otherwise I could not reach on my own. He gives us another example. As the Lord loves us, and forgives us, even when we seem unlovable, even when we do wrong. He gives us another example in 1 John 3.12. He says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother, and for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. The story comes out of Genesis chapter four, the story of two brothers, take a look at it. Genesis 4, picking up in the second part of the verse, the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? 
But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and he killed him. As much as the Lord did it right, we see an example that scriptures give us of Cain who certainly did it wrong. In the flesh, they were both sons of a mother and of a father, but in their heart, as John talked about the first part of this passage, they had a much different father. One was a child of God, the other a child of Satan in their heart. And it really doesn't matter what you think in your head as much as what you feel in your heart. Because our perceptions of the head change very frequently. Our positions and our opinions change all the time. But our passion is motivated by what's in our heart, what we believe and what's really important to us. And in their hearts, they were very, very different people. Abel gave out of love to honor God in thankfulness. In Hebrews 11:4, it says that we are that he gave by faith, and by faith he offered a better sacrifice than his brother Cain. So we see that Abel gave by faith and had that. Cain maybe was giving out of a sense of ritual. Well, this is what we're supposed to do. Dad taught us that we were supposed to give offerings to God, so fine, there's my offering. I did it. Hooray, go God. I'm a follower. Yay. Problem is, we've got Christians that cheat the Lord the same way. Well, I was brought up in the church, or I said I did at one point in time, and I go to church and I do the things I'm supposed to do. Yay, God. I'm a Christian. Very concerning. His heart wasn't in it. And John says his heart, Cain's heart, was evil. The Lord said of his actions, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? So the Lord tells us that you know, his heart was not right. He said, what you have done, Cain, is wrong. The way that you did it, the reason that you did it was not righteous. And so it was wrong, and it wasn't accepted. Even though he did the right thing. He didn't do it with the right heart. And there's a strong warning that comes here. He says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. God asked Cain, he says, why are you so upset? Why is your face downcast? Why are you so glum? Why are you so sour? God has given us so much, so much to be happy for. And then when things kind of not, don't go our way, how quickly we go, well, doggone it anyway. And we get glum and we get sour and we get angry and our face gets downcast because things aren't going the way that we thought that they ought to. Or they're not going as good as we hoped they would. And the first thing we do is start kicking rocks. Well, doggone it. God says, why are you so downcast? All that I've given you to be happy in and to have joy in. Bad things happen to good people. Can I control that? No. But I have said, and I will continue to say, that I can control how I'm going to respond to that. And I can respond in joy. I can respond saying, I am curious to see what God's going to do. And I'm looking forward to that. Don't be a Cain. Cain had all the same options that, that Abel did, and yet chose anger, and chose to be downcast. He says, sin is crouching at your door. It desires you. Sin is looking for an opportunity to step into your life. God told Cain, you must rule over it. Sin is defeatable. Christ proved that. Sin is forgivable. Christ offered that. And we can be righteous before the Lord. Conflict is inevitable. Whenever a person of the world and a person of Christ come together, conflict is inevitable. Here's the thing, we can have victory in Christ if we rely on his strength, but when we try and fight the world with the world, everybody loses. When we demonstrate our love for one another, when we live out our love for one another, when it is obvious to the world that you are following Jesus Christ and his teachings and his commandments and you're loving on one another, providing for one another, forgiving one another, having compassion for one another, enjoying the company of one another, and worshiping God together, and it's lived out loud, it's faith outside where people can see it, then 1 John 3.13 kicks in. Do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Oh, joy. Here's your reward in the world for loving Jesus. The world will hate you. What great happiness to know that the world out there is going to look at you and go, oh, you're one of those Christians, one of those church people. Are you? And is that going to cost, cause you to, to fall back? 
When the world persecutes you, prosecutes you, looks down and goes, oh, fine, you're one of those Christian people. <laughs> yes, I am, to, to the glory of God. Because here's the thing, when you live like that, and the world sees that in our life, and they see brotherly love in our actions, and they see that we are following Jesus Christ and obeying him and living our faith outside, out loud, where they can see it, then they're confronted with something. Because Jesus, as I've heard it said and taught several times, was either a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. Well, we know he was not lying. Too many tests inside and outside of religion have proved that Jesus was not lying. Too many historical facts we have to back up the things that he said had happened, will happen, and have happened. Jesus was not a liar. Jesus was not a lunatic. Great studies have been done by men that, that know different mental illnesses and, and have re, uh, looked through his life and said that he exemplified nothing that was of mental illness. He was not a lunatic. Well, if he's not a liar and he's not a lunatic, then that leaves one option. He is Lord. So now they're looking at you and you are living the followings of, teach, of Jesus Christ out loud, outside, out, living out loud. And so now they're looking at you and they're saying, well, you are either a liar, a lunatic, or a witness. But if I'm of the world, I want you to be a liar or a lunatic. Because if you're a witness of the truth, then that means I have to change. So don't be surprised when the world comes to you and says, you are crazy. You are absolutely nuts. Or just tells you, you know what, that is all a lie. The Bible is nothing more than a grouping of, of great stories about a fictional character. Don't be surprised when that happens. The world is rebelling against the truth. And as much as they do not want Jesus to be Lord, they do not want you to be a witness of the truth. So when we live our faith out loud, don't be surprised when the world comes after you. He says, don't be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 1.18. The world wants this to be foolishness. The things that we believe in faith, the life that we live out loud for the Lord, the willingness to stand and pay any cost, any penalty, even unto death, the world wants that to be foolishness. The way that we give to one another and give to the work that God is doing, they want this to be foolishness. And indeed, the Lord says in his word that it is. 1 Corinthians 1.18 for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. I remember before I accepted the Lord, I would sit down every so often. I mean, I accepted the Lord when I was a little kid, but, when I, but I wasn't following the Lord. And every once in a while, I would pick up this Bible, and I would try and read it. And without the givings of the Holy Spirit, I would read through it some, and I would say to myself, who can understand this? It just doesn't make sense. It just doesn't, there's, there's no story, there's no beginning, there's no ending, there's, this is the worst written book I've ever tried to read. Because you don't have the Holy Spirit, the word of God is so hard to understand. And yet it's so simple. That's why we have throughout scripture, it says to teach the scriptures to our children. Can God's word bring somebody to believe? Absolutely. If they are seeking to understand it, God says, I will help you to understand it. If you come to it without a desire to seek God, if you come to it from a worldly standpoint to prove its inaccuracies, its fallacies, your mind and your great wisdom of the world will find all sorts of foolishness. 
Paul says as he wrote this, God has made the wisdom of the world foolishness. God has proven repeatedly that his wisdom is greater. As we continue to get wiser in the world, with that in big quotes, I find that God's wisdom continues to resound and stay true. I find that man's wisdom continues to change from generation to generation. The knowledge of man changes. Wisdom is nothing more than the application of knowledge. And so as we get smarter and smarter, quote unquote, we apply that new information to the way that we live our lives in the world, and we find the world following farther and farther away from God. Is it any surprise when we look around the world at the state that it's in today, as it follows the wisdom of the world, that we see the moral decay? How far away the world is from righteousness, right living, the standard of, of moral, ethical conduct according to God's standard. And we look at the world, we say, that is about as far away as you're going to get because it has turned away the wisdom of God. Follow through with me in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Paul says, for consider your calling, brethren, that there were not men, many wise according to the flesh, but many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world and the despised God that the despised God has chosen, the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us the wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. God has said, I've looked, he's, I've looked at all the wisdom, all the things that, that weren't out, spoke out against God, and God has said, I've made foolish all of these arguments against me. If we're going to boast about anything, he says, let us boast in the Lord. If we're going to be proud of anything that we have accomplished, let it be that we have accepted the truth of the Lord. Let it be that we put everything back on the Lord for all that he has done. Turn with me to Acts 2, 43 through 47. So what great joy to stand out in the world so that the world can hate you. What great, what great opportunity to go into the world along the learned amongst the, 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 the nations and say, look at the wisdom of the Lord and let us, let us speak about these things. God says, let us come and reason together. And so we're called to go out into the world and to reason against them and to talk with them and share the Lord and to share the truth of the gospel with them. And the answer is, because you do these things, don't be surprised when the world hates you. Why would we do that? Why would we live our faith out loud? Why would we publicly demonstrate our love for one another and for the world around us? Why not then just take this faith that we have for the Lord Jesus Christ and live it in a closet? Wouldn't it be a lot safer to say, well, I believe in Jesus Christ, absolutely. I'm going to sit over here, I'm going to talk all about him. I'm going to read my Bible here. Amen. A nice, quiet faith. I love Jesus. I don't want them to know because I don't want to be hated by him. But God, it's all good, right? Seems kind of ridiculous, doesn't it? And yet, we have so many people that live their faith just that way. They live their faith behind a curtain. Fully pleased in the quietness of their home, the quietness of a room, or maybe just in the safety of a church to go, yep, I love Jesus. But get them outside in the public. Get them outside where the world might have something to say about it. Shh. Why step out? Why be so bold in our faith? Well, read here with me in Acts chapter 2, verse 43 through 47. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. The Holy Spirit had come. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And they were going from house to house, and they were loving on each other. They were living their faith out, out loud. It was obvious to everyone around them in Jerusalem that they were believers in Jesus Christ, and they were following Jesus Christ, and they were living it out loud. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. Are we still amazed by God and what he has done? Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles and all those who had believed were together. They had all things in common and they began selling their property and possessions and sharing them with all as anyone might have need. 
day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Faith lived out loud. Loving one another, living for one another, living for the Lord. And the response is that thousands were being saved. That's the result, guys. When we live our faith out loud, when we live our love for one another outside where people can see it and don't hide it behind a curtain, don't hide it inside the walls of a church, that's when the thousands get saved. Showing our love, growing our love, taking our love out into the world, that's what the world is going to see. Inside these walls, amongst one another, it's what's gonna build each other up because we have new believers that come in that need to be shored up and loved on. So certainly we want to do it in here as well. But that love that we demonstrate for one another, that's what's going to draw people into Christ. Focusing on serving God by serving others. 1 John 3, verses 14 through 15. John says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. This is the greatest evidence we have. Anybody ever said said to themselves, you know, I've accepted the Lord, I think, uh, and I think I'm saved, I think. How do you know? Well, we've got these little tests, I suppose, God has given us, little examples that, that we see that we are loving Christ. And one of them that he gives us is this, that we love one another. He says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren in a righteous way. When we do this for one another, when we live that outside and we are doing things for one another because of love, because of the love that Christ shared with us, then we know that we have love for him. Can I still do good things for people? Absolutely. But it's righteous love when the motive is because of what God has done. And so that becomes our test that we can We can look at our lives and go, how well am I loving others? Because that really speaks to how well I love the Lord. The opposite of this, he says, is true as well. Those who hate follow and live in hate. They abide in death. They live in death. And this is where we need to be really careful, brethren, because we have an opportunity to love on one another. When we miss that opportunity, several things might go missing. You might miss the opportunity to share the gospel with that person. What if you were the last opportunity? You might miss the opportunity for your own growth to share the ministry, to share the gospel with somebody and see them come to faith, to see them come to the belief that Jesus is and to ask for him to forgive their sins. You might be a part of that. And when you do, if you do, I pray that you do, make sure that you understand the next steps to share the gospel and then pray with them to accept the Lord. But just as importantly, we need to make sure that we are loving each other. Because how does that look to the world if we've got conflict amongst ourselves. Like I already said, we let each other down. We do. We break promises. We, we, we don't show up for meetings. We say we're going to do something and we don't. We let each other down. And yet, we're to love one another. If I act out with hostility or with resentment towards somebody else who is a follower of Jesus Christ, what joy does that bring to the Lord? How can I possibly make his name magnified if I act that way? Why would he bother to call me friend if if I'm so quick to act out against a brother. And when we see somebody doing that, maybe they're doing it out of resentment. Maybe they're doing it because, well, maybe they never really truly accepted the Lord. Maybe it's it's a head decision and not a heart decision. Maybe it's because they believed, but maybe they're a very young Christian and they're still learning and growing, and that gives us an opportunity to teach and to love and to grow through that. Whatever the circumstances, it's not what God desires for us. The command was to love one another. To those of us who say that we've loved and trusted him to act in a way that actually shows it out, to prove it out to him. And it should be a warning for us that causes us to pray and to ask for forgiveness for ourselves. Two big points about showing brotherly love. It distinguishes us, distinguishes us as the children of God. And it demonstrates the reality of our faith, not only to the world, but to us really quiet in here. 
1 John 3.16, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John 3.16. This is cool. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You ever put those two verses together that easily? John 3.16, whether you go to 1 John or the, 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 uh, the Gospel of John. It's a great lesson there in John 3.16. And Jesus exemplified that love in his sacrifice for us. The word agape that's used here for love is often described active good will. This isn't love in an existential, I love ice cream. I love yarn. <laughs> no, it's not that kind of love. It's an active love. It's what you do with your love. It's a kind of love that says, because I love, I have action. I have deeds that back up that love. And Jesus laid down his life for us. And we're called to possibly, potentially, even one day, lay down our lives for someone else. Because he said to love one another as I loved you, sacrificially. What are we willing to give up for the love of one another? Maybe it's nothing more than pride. Maybe it's just the time to consider somebody else's point of view and consider that maybe I'm wrong. Sacrificing maybe actually instead of dying for them, it might mean living for them. 1 John 3.17, but whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? If you see somebody that's in need and don't take care of those needs, how does that demonstrate living in God's love? I, I, the idea of seeing that person that's on the street corner that says, I need something, and, I, and we get so callous to that because you know, spaceship broke down, need fuel rods. <laughs> you know, we'll work for food. And you bring them food and they're like, I, don't, I wanted money. We've gotten callous to this. There are fakers and posers out there. You know, they, they sit there and they've got their beat up sign and their dirty clothes and at the end of the day they go and they climb into their $5,000 car and they drive home to their house. That's how they make their living. These things happen and so it makes us callous to that. The problem is there are really people out there who need help. There really are. And so if we see that need, and we see that need, especially within the brethren, he says, and we ignore that need, how does the love of God abide in him? The root of justification is by faith. The fruit of justification is by works. When we are justified, when we are made right before God, that happened because of our faith, and that's great. But of what use is it if it has no works? I'm not going to go there, but James you know, has a whole passage that talks about you know, having good works in your life and, and knowing people by their works and knowing their faith by their works. It's great that you've been saved. Amen. Praise God for that. But if there's no works behind it, no love behind it for the brethren, of what use is it? To the glory of yourself, I got saved. Hooray, that is good news. But of what use is it? God didn't save you for just you. God saved you for the world, for his glory. Multi-generational outreach is kind of a word that we've been throwing around here. We want to reach all the generations. We want to reach all the people to intentionally influence every relationship with the gospel. To intentionally influence every relationship with the gospel. That is life, that is faith lived out. That is love in action, intentionally influencing every relationship with the gospel. And if we do it, and if we do it with righteous intent, not self-intent, if we do it with a heart to serve the Lord, it's gonna bear fruit. 1 John 3, verses 18 through 21. Little children, let us not love the word. Little children, let us not love the word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth 
and we will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. It's not enough just to say it. We've got to do it. To love not just in words, but truly love through deeds, serving God by serving others. And to love others righteously with a heart that God says, yes, that's the reason I wanted you to love them. Not so that they would go, wow, that Craig Kinney's one heck of a guy. I want them to go, wow, Craig really believes in Jesus Christ. And I see what, what Christ is doing through that guy. I want to know more about that. I want to love people like that. Do you feel God's spirit of love tugging at your heart right now? I know when I was preparing this lesson, I was condemned by it. I thought, wow, I am not doing this as well as I could be. By a long shot. Matthew Henry said, if conscience condemns us in known sin or the neglect of known duty, God does so too. If the Spirit of God is in you going, you are not doing this well, then God is saying, you are not doing this well. <laughs> and we ought to, as I said earlier on, listen to what God has to say to us. Because God has a way of getting our attention if we ignore him. And you might not like that way. Beloved, he says in verse 21, if our, hearts, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence. There's a fix for this. To surrender to his love and to love others as he has loved us. And the result is to know God's peace. To feel his satisfaction. To, and when we do that, then our confidence to continue to love and go and to grow grows that much more. When you're doing what God wants you to do, it's going to be obvious. When you're, doing, when you're in God's will and you're walking down the path of righteousness that God wants you to walk down, it is going to be obvious because God's peace will be on you. You will feel confident in the decisions you are doing, and you will not be convicted in your heart. When you're walking some weird direction where God does not want you to be and you're doing the things God does not want you to do, you should feel guilty, convicted, and wrong. It should be a struggle. There should be hurdles and nothing but problems in your path. God says, that's because you're one of my children and you're not walking in the direction that I've called you to walk. Here's the cool thing. Anybody ever got lost walking down a path? You know how to get fixed out of that? Turn around. If you're going the wrong way, turn around. Men, I know this is hard for us. Turn around. Go the right way. First John 3, 22 through 23 and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Another commandment he throws out there for us, that we are to love, believe, trust in Jesus Christ. And when we do, we get a result out of that. And whatever we ask, we receive from him. Let's face it, happy dads are better givers. Anybody ever really made dad mad and then went to him and said, dad, can I borrow the keys to the car? <laughs> and dad said, sure. No, happy dads are better givers. It's not any different with our Lord. Okay? When we're praying and we're asking, Lord, I'm asking for, let's make sure that we've done things to make dad happy. That we're pleasing in his sight. We've asked for forgiveness of the things that we're doing wrong because that too makes our Father in heaven happy. And finally this, 1 John 3, 24, the one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in them. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. When we keep his commandments, we are living in his will. And he says, I will live in you. I will live through you. This is a condition for living in Christ to keep his commandments. And how do we know that Christ truly abides in us? Because he keeps his commandments. How am I knowing that I'm, obeying, that I'm obeying his commandments? How do I know that I'm loving others the way that I ought to? It's going to be apparent. Because we're going to see the blessing in our lives. We're going to feel that approval in our heart. We're going to see the things that we are doing bringing glory to God. If the things that we are doing are not glorifying God, we are not doing things right. You will see others blessed by his love working through you. People will ask so many times, God, I wish you would just do this. And God says, I am trying. I'm asking you to be the person to help me get it done. Oh, well, I'm, I'm busy that day. 
God wasn't too busy the day that he sent his son to die on the cross. Jesus wasn't too busy the day that they hung him on a cross. Jesus wasn't too busy the day that he came out of that tomb. Jesus isn't going to be too busy the day that you stand before the throne. Does God's love abide in you? Am I abiding in God's love? Hebrews 10.24 says, encourage one another to love and to be helpful. Encourage one another, support one another, lift each other up. Man, what can we do better for the Lord today? Hebrews 13.1 says that we should love and let, brother, rather let brotherly love continue. In this church, I have seen great examples of brotherly love. It does live here and it does work here. I have seen it as I look out across these faces. I have seen so many examples of brotherly love. Let it continue. Let our love for one another be apparent. Let it be abundant. And as the world looks at this body of believers, and as this world looks at you, and you're a follower of Jesus Christ, let it be obvious that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you sent the Son to die on the cross for our sins while we were still sinners, while we were still doing this horribly wrong. You loved us and you gave the Son for us. Lord, you've promised that when we say that, you know, Lord, I am, I am not living out brotherly love. I am not showing it to the world around me. I'm not showing it to the brethren. Lord, you give us that opportunity to repent, to turn away, to, to walk the right path. God, I'm just asking that we would do that that in great humility, we would say, you know what? I can love better, or maybe I'm loving wrong. Either way, Lord, I want to love for you because you loved me. You give us opportunities, Lord. Help to open our eyes and our hearts to see those opportunities. And then, Lord, get us motivated and, and give us the, 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 the attitude of yes to the glory of your kingdom. I will step forward. If the world asks me, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I will say yes. Lord, even more so, I hope that they don't have to ask. I hope that they can look on us and go, that person is a Christian because we are living our faith out loud, serving you, Lord God, by serving others in righteous love. Lord Jesus, to you be the glory for all that you did that made this possible. Amen.